There are countless times, forget fantasy settings, in the real world where we've been completely dumbfounded by the advent of some new technology, completely disrupting industries or the common square. Like, think about social media even, how it's just changed the way people talk to each other. It's been a massive tectonic shift for our culture. It's gonna be the same with your fictional settings if you want them to feel grounded and realistic. So how do you prime your setting to absorb these fantastical elements in a way that feels grounded and realistic. So let's talk about that a little bit. Welcome to the Worldcraft Club podcast, a show for writers looking to create rich, immersive worlds for their audience to get lost in time and time again. My name is James, your host, and today I'm joined once again by Andrew Zimba, author of Times of War, A Tale of Our Dallin Corps. Now, we'd spoken previously with him on the audio podcast and in another YouTube episode that got released a little bit ago. Uh, if you spin back to episode 55, you can go and find him there talking a little bit more about his book series. But uh, how you doing, Andy? Doing great, James. Yeah, good to be back. Thanks. Uh, always up for talking world building. So we, we got a new topic today. So that's great. Yeah, I'm excited about it. So, like, uh, what, what what kind of brought this up? Disruptive elements in your fantasy setting. How this is taken from your Substack. It's something you've been developing on a little bit. Why don't you give us just a little introduction about what made you think this was uh, was a was a particularly pointed topic to go into? Yeah, and this is just from the evolution of my own writing. A lot of these lessons that I share on Substack, and we we talk about this is you know developed over time. I had to kind of learn these as I went, but one of the things. In, in world building, I think there's there's two there's two modalities. One is setting your world up, which is yeah. like all of the things that you want to include. Yeah. And then there's setting your world in motion. So mm. we've picked time travel and immortality and dragons. Like that's that's the what. Yeah. But setting your world in motion is the how. How do all of these things come together? Yeah. And with world building so being so expansive. My basic guidance is build the world you want, tell the story you want. And yeah. Everything else is just kind of guidance to help to help inform that. There's so many resources on the what of world yeah. building. Yeah. You may have seen the the world building uh, periodic table of elements. Yeah. And yeah, there's, yeah, yeah. there's over a hundred categories in, in this table. Yeah. And it's a good list. It gives you a framework. We're building a world. You don't have to pick all of those elements and you can debate whether they're too narrow or too broad or should there be, you know, uh, sub subgroups of, of each of these. But it's a good framework to try to ground your thoughts and figure out what's most relevant to the setting and the story that, that you want to tell. Yeah, it's, it's more like yeah. a menu than an exhaustive yeah. list of things you need. To, it's like you're going to pick the things you want in the setting. Yeah. 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 There's other articles out there um, that are like hundreds of questions you could ask yourself to aid in character development or, or, or world building. But there's this other piece that I, I just kind of distilled down as to what is the how of yeah. this world? How do these things fit together, especially when they're disruptive elements? There's yeah, things that yeah. either don't exist in our modern world, or if you were to kick them up uh, you know, multiple degrees, that it becomes something very very different yeah and I, I think i think the way to do that is your elements i also think of it as like it's your list of lists <laughs> right here's all the cultures here is the flora and fauna here's all the the fantastical creatures and you have you have all this information that you've you've gathered for mundane fa or, or fantastic for for your setting and incorporating disruptive elements i would say go through that list and yeah highlight or call out here are things that i think in my setting are it's unusual it's disruptive i'm not sure how this would if this existed in modern day hmm. we'd have to figure out it, it would be a game changer in some way yeah yeah well th th this this you've basically encapsulated everything that pissed me off about bright on netflix I, I rant about this like pretty frequently um like <laughs> during like firesides our, our weekly server meetup but like in Bright, they just haphazardly included so much crap that just like never gets kind of like it even that there's no sense that the world is adapting to the existence of mm. some of these elements. And like, I, I get it. They had a story they wanted to tell, but they have a dragon just flying around in the background at one point. And they're like, you know, helicopters and stuff. And like, there's no 
indication. Like, I don't need the story to be about the dragon that's flying around, but, yeah. like, include some stuff in it. Like, having the dragon hauling a cargo crate would place the character, place the dragon in world such okay. that I can go, oh, that's interesting. And it sort of sparks wonder and a little bit of joy. But just having the sucker flying around in the back there, I was like, you're throwing like a serious wrench in the works in terms of world building that is doing nothing. You know, like it's not carrying any weight. It's not making me feel like I'm there. It's just sort of just, you know, you kit bashed it in and we're like, here you go. Um, yeah. But I haven't seen the show, but it sounds like you're just at, it's a, a loose, a loose thread at best and maybe distracting from the scene. That's, that's how I feel. Yeah. It's like, I, I think the first thing of world building is the same with the Hippocratic Oath, right? Do no harm. Like if your world building <laughs> is like screwing up the story, like it's bad world building, right? Like, and that, that's kind of what like drove me nuts about it. Sorry. Yeah. It's, it's worth checking out for the cringe. Um, it's actually, there were some cool ideas in it and that's what made it so frustrating okay. a lot of people thought they were going to get shadow run, you know, like a cybernetically augmented elf with a sniper rifle can never go wrong. But like it's uh, so I, I don't know if you're familiar with Shadowrun, but it's basically just no, like, I'm, I'm not, but I'm enjoying your description. Oh, yeah. That. Well, I, I think I may have just summed it up pretty much. It's like, there's okay. uh, there's a lot of, it's, it's like uh like cyberpunk meets dungeons and dragons. And okay. um, it's, it's really, really cool. It's a heist game and it's a ton of fun. And when people saw modern setting fantasy elements, like people were sort of like, is this going to feel like Shadowrun? Because this could be really cool. And instead, like, they, it kind of was a bit of a mush. Um, again, some cool ideas actually mixed in there. But, like, it was just altogether yeah. a bit of a mess. Um, so th what you're telling me reminds me of a joke um, that I heard a while ago. I'm sorry. I'm not meaning to totally derail us. But, like... No, go ahead. Um, go ahead. So there, there was a, a guy driving along the road. And uh, his car breaks down. And uh, uh, the guy's a doctor and he calls up a mechanic to come and help. Mechanic goes in there and, you know, drives up in his, in his tow truck, hops out, pops open the hood of the car and starts working on the engine. And uh, while the mechanic's working on the engine, you know, he's kind of rounding, rounding the corner about to finish up. You know, he's kind of sat there, you know, wiping up his hands and he's, you know, putting that last quart of oil in there, says to the doctor and just goes, yeah, yeah so, so you're a doctor, right? Like he goes, yeah, he says, well. I don't, the way I see it, I don't think our jobs are that different. And the doctor goes, you know, well, tell me more. And he's like, you know, well, I, I look into the car and I see a problem and then I go and I, I fix the problem. So why don't you tell me why you make four times as much as I do? And the doctor simply leans into the car, turns it on and says, now work on it. Right. This is the difference sure. between the what yeah. and the how in world building, right? It's like when yeah. you've got a bunch of stationary elements that you can pull apart and experiment on, you've got a yeah. lot of freedom to interact with it and to play with it and to work with it. And you can sort of like, you can throw everything in there. But when you've got to make the machine run and then yeah, work on example. it while it's running, that's a different yeah. story. That's, that's the big money. You know, sorry, it's just, yes. it, it just struck me as a really good way to sum up some of what you're saying between the what and the how. But yeah, I think that's a great example. Yeah, because we take these maybe amorphous at times or we try to be pithy with these world building or writing comments. But it's those examples that this is what I mean. It's like this is a living, breathing place. Yeah. And you put these elements together. What is it actually going to be like? And you probably don't know that at first glance. Yeah. Right. You have to think about, okay, here's an example. Let's take, you know, take a large example or take a very finite example. How would this work? Uh, Bradley in the uh, comments had just said, you know, very active deities like that. To me, that's a incredibly, you have some uh, uh, omnipotent, omniscient, uh, potentially deity in, in intervening in things. That's a whole nother level of magnitude of complexity yeah. as well. So I, I definitely agree with that. Um, I think it's taking, like we said, do we do we have the dragon in the show or not? Is it is it relevant or how do we use it? So we've we've picked the elements that we want to use, and then we highlight, okay, these we think these are disruptive. Yeah, and look at each one of those because it, it can be a lot. Like thinking about all the aspects of the world building, right? It's it's. It's huge. It's enormous. And then writing a story in this setting. 
But if we take those elements, this this helped me. Let's boil it down to we'll take one item. Mm. We'll take time travel or, or whatever. We can talk about other ones too. But rarity, you know, mm. how, how many people can do this yeah. in the world? Proximity, like if, if, some, if there's dragons, let's say, do they live next door? Yeah. Uh, the Game of Thrones is a great example, right? If something happens beyond the wall, like people in the north are, are very skittish. They're very concerned. If something is out of the ordinary, they're going to listen. Yeah. If you, if you try to explain the same thing to people in King's Landing or Dorne or other places south, they basically can't be bothered to listen to you. This, this might as well be on the other side of the world. It's oh, so yeah. far away. Yeah, yeah. Right? Uh, if there's a kraken that lives outside of London, mm. like lives in the Thames estuary, it probably doesn't become a great commercial center. Yeah. Right? If, yeah. if you have this impediment, it's probably one or the other, I would say, at least as a starting point. And then you can figure out if there's a middle ground between those. But it's it's those things. Like how, how close are these things? Or is it under the... Is, do they live down by Antarctic, so they're almost out of the way as not to matter yeah. in some ways. So proximity, however you define that. Uh, and then barriers to entry. Like what are the limitations? That would be another way to say it. Yeah, 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 it, yeah. Is, is magic accessible to everybody? Yeah, so you've got like is it, teleportation, but it's incredibly expensive to do. Yeah. Or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah. The, is there material components? Is it uh, like a, a genetics, like Jedi or X Men yeah, thing? Yeah, just what very the rare mutation. That, yeah, yeah. And what, whatever it may be, like however you take those things. So I look at it as more as here's a framework. Take those three things: rarity, proximity, barriers to entry, and some of them may matter more depending on the element. But kind of run that through. Uh, run that through that lens. How many magic users out there? I don't think you mm. have to know mm. the exact number. Like how many wizards can use fireball in this setting? Is it 2,500 or 2,510? I don't think you need to know that. Yeah, yeah. But there's a difference between there's five people who know how to do this and there's 10,000 or depending, or there's a million, right? That gives you a sense of, of scale and degrees of difficulty that you're working with. And obviously if there's fewer people who can do these things, it just becomes much more manageable in general. But uh, let, let, me, let me get your thoughts on that. What do you think about that? I think that's a really solid framework. I think the proximity one is like an interesting thing. I, I would include temporal proximity in that, like the amount yeah. of time, right? So like yeah. a, another thing in Game of Thrones is that they, they're they in the middle of a long summer. And so, um, the, the 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 sort of mental distance that they have from it is uh it, it's it, it, even the people in the north are kind of like they're worried about wildlings they're not worried about uh you know the uh oh, i forget what it's called the the undead armies rising in the north right they they're, they're not concerned about that it takes time for them to get there but folks like yeah. ned stark and folks who keep the old ways have a you know winter is coming being the house words are are very sort of conscious of that yeah and like yeah that's an interesting thing to throw in there as well because like it, it's one thing I, I think uh dallin uh during our episode about accents and dialects had discussed is a great way to sort of make world building feel alive in some ways is to allow people to not know much about things that are happening in your world because the reality is is people in our own world, don't really know much about what's happening. You know, it's like it's yeah. one place or another if something was distant in time. So it's okay to have people speak with that ignorance. So that that's the kind of thing that I would throw in there is um, temporal proximity as well as um, as well yeah. as like you know spatial proximity. Yes, um, which I think is really really nice. I I wonder if rarity and limitations might better be compacted into one thing though. Oh, I, I, I yeah, would. What do you think? I would that? say that would be the that would be the third one. I would say rarity. You could also call it limitations. Yeah. Oh wait. So wait. What, what, I, I, there was proximity, and there was I thought rarity and limitation, right? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, I see what you mean. Yeah. I, I said rare, rarity, proximity, and barriers to entry. Bar and barriers to entry. Mean, My fault. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I and I see what you mean by limitations. Could that also be rarity as well? I guess. Or I guess rarity would sense. be a limitation in some ways. Yeah. But yeah. I think I would look at it as how many people 
can time travel. And let's say there's five people. Yeah, yeah. And then if another five people wanted to learn how is to Is the barrier to entry genetic? Could, could they do it? that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Is could it just that it's that a hard skill? Yeah. So there, yes. there's, there's a, a way to then acquire that. So you've got like the Correct. teleportation yeah. thing has... Uh, you know, reagents that are extremely expensive would be a limitation on it. But the fact yeah. that only the only the wealthy can accomplish it might be that. Which is also, it's also interesting because applying these sorts of rules to game-changing elements of, uh, of a world also gives you a really good opening for a character, be they a villain or a hero, to exploit those things, right? Yes. Um, like if the Kraken befriends the main character <laughs> like you have a wrench to throw in the works and a story that could very yeah. easily be written around that character or if you have a villain for example who has mastered a kraken in some ways or has learned how yeah. to teleport cheaply and efficiently like that yes. suddenly changes things you know like uh i, I think that there's a big thing in the, in the harry potter books where voldemort can fly and they're like, oh crap, <laughs> like, because it was, but there were supposed to be limitations on that. And it was like a big deal. Yeah. It wasn't the same in the movies, but like, it was one of those things where it was like, there are, that's an opportunity for the villain to display just how capable they are, which is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Limitations present opportunities in writing, I think. A lot of Absolutely. I'm, I mean, basically, it's, uh, it's drama, like you mm -hmm. said. And, it's a way to going through this world building exercise. Probably, you know, most people with maybe with notable exceptions, you don't build an entire world mm, mm. and then think about the characters and, and the stories you want to tell. Like I, I came up with two characters and then created the story in our Dalincor yeah. around them, but I wanted them to be rooted in the world. Yeah. The world wasn't force fit around them. They were, they were of the world. So there's this calibration and back and forth. But like you said, take these elements, yeah. think about how it exists in the world, and then, hey, there's an angle here. Like You could exploit this. Or yeah, what if you, because this, this Kraken is such a menace, what if you took a different approach? Yeah. Well, suddenly you have a tremendous leverage. Oh, that probably should be a character or could be a character. And then you start to spin these things off, but it's rooted in a sense of place yeah. And also proportionality and, and restraint and curation that takes place in your world, which I think is so, so important too. like because it's rare or because mm. there's limitations, therefore it matters. It matters yeah. more because if it's if it's ubiquitous, if everybody can time travel, that would be quite a story to keep straight. Like if uh, even I don't know. Uh, 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 Usually it's one or two people, right? Or two yeah, groups yeah. of people who can time travel. If you said a thousand, a million people can time travel, good good luck writing that, that story. And, and the continuity jumps and timeline and things like, how would that actually work? So a, a bit of limiting these things, but also getting a sense of what am I working with and what kind of challenge hmm. do I want? What kind of challenge am I up for in how I build this? And then here, here are my items. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, I was, I, was, I was just kind of, this just leads me on to what one of, one of our like, you know, Worldcraft Club bingo cards sort of elements is that boundaries uh, create story. They don't, they don't destroy it. Like, I think a lot of people yeah. think about their imaginations as being, you know, this, this boundless enterprise and they don't want to slow it down. They don't want to curtail it in any way. When the reality is, is that sometimes like setting a limitation on something creates opportunity for story. And, um, I think I think it's too often that folks kind of they want to avoid kind of doing that. And I, I think in some ways what you're proposing here, I think, is is a really useful paradigm just to just to look at I, I would say almost to some extent like major systems in your world to kind of like explore them. Um like I would say even like, you know, sort of as a mode of analysis for your magic system, you know or a mode of analysis for your politics system or religious system. You could look at it in terms of almost like kind of proximity, rarity, and uh, and what was your last one? It's barriers to entry. Barriers right? to entry, yeah. Yeah, you, yep. could, you could actually take this mode of analysis and, and really apply it to a lot of different things, which is kind of, I don't know. I think it's I think it's an interesting way to do things. As certainly with um, I, I think about D and D campaigns as well as as well as uh, as well as writing books and establishing characters and particularly villains. Yeah. 
I'm glad you mentioned D and D because yeah. <laughs> I was I was talking to somebody who uh, a game master, dungeon master, was run, running for a group. Yeah, and had set up a scene, a classic trope where the rogue and the bard go into the the market fair. You know, it's it's market day and steal, cajole, take a number of things out of you know out of the uh, the merchants' uh, stalls. Yeah, and I said, do you ever think about because I'm more thinking this in like writing my books of if that was an element in the world, how often is this happening? Yeah. Like if you're a merchant who's constantly being pilfered and these things are disappearing, what what's your response? I said, do you ever think about the merchant? I said to this uh, dungeon master, do you ever think about the merchant's response and like yeah. what happens in the next town or the next time? And the individual said no, because he had a different perspective. He's like, yeah. I'm entertaining my players. Yeah. We're having fun. And that that's great. However you play the game, like some want more of a gritty realistic. Some was just, let's just relax, roll dice, kill some monsters, have fun. However you play is, is totally cool and up to you. But I think that's an interesting thing to look at mm. is if mm. there's these elements of magic, you know, how does the economy function if this is a constant thing or, do merchants change their practice? There's, I think you, one type of cleric or wizard, I forget which one, can you can take like a wooden slug or a, a slice of wood, turn it into a coin for some amount of time, like a transmutation kind of a thing. Well, yeah, but if people kept with doing it, that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, it's like, okay, you've paid. You can now come back in an hour and yeah. pick up your goods because I have to see if this is legitimate or there's like little detectors or you can drop it in water and see how the refraction takes place, like non-magical things yeah. that merchants are starting to figure out or it, it slows down commerce or there's much more regulation of magic because, you know, if merchants are complaining about stuff, that's the flow of money. Usually someone's going to listen to hmm. that. Now, that might be too crunchy. Yeah, or either yeah. a D&D campaign or a story that you want to write. But it's an interesting thing to think about as I'm introducing this and how rare is it? Like if something goes missing once a year, is a merchant going to pay that much attention? Probably not. Yeah, yeah. But if this is a frequent enough occurrence, what's the response of the world? Well, it kind of goes back to your car mechanic example. Yeah. Like the body is going to react real time to, to interventions. Whatever you do. I, but, but sorry, please, please go ahead. No, no, I, I was actually, this got me thinking about Terry Pratchett, to be honest, like, and the Thieves Guild. Um, and like, there, there's like a few things. It's like the Thieves Guild becomes like this canonized group of of individuals who have like official members and things like that. And the, and the Thieves Guild wind up being tolerated because they do a better job at policing crime than anyone else because they, they mm. kind of keep it regulated and in a lot yeah. of ways. And so like Terry Pratchett had this hilarious way of looking at these things. And like, I, I would certainly say like, it's, it comes down to, you, you know, your first bit of advice that you dropped, you know, is that if this is what you want to do, like if this is the story you want to tell, and to be fair, I think Terry Pratchett is proof that you can write a story about that if you want, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you can write something yeah. about that, but like, is that what you want to do? And it sounds like, you know, your, um, uh, your, your DM friend was sort of like, in a way, kind of following the, 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 the golden rule of just like, I know what I want to do. I know what I want to make. And I'm not going to, that's, that's not within the scope of the adventure right. that I want to, yeah. I want to have. And I think like, yep. that's really like, as ever, just the best bit of, of advice that you can give anybody when you're starting is just sort of make what you want to make. But I think considering yeah. those implications is a fun way to find new content as well, which is really cool. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. And it gives a sense of the, that there's depth to the world. There's, there's something extra. Yeah. And even if it's just a little like a line or two, like, hey, we got to be careful now. They've implemented some new protocols or whatever the case may be. Or yeah. uh, the, the Kraken was last sighted. It's kind of patrolling and it's uh, we think it's to the west. So we can we can sail at this time. We're kind of in between the, the migratory seasons yeah. of, of these. Uh, so it gives us a window to conduct trade. Yeah. But we still have to worry about this at the same at the same time as well. So. I think that's great. I think that's a great way to create an artifact in your world, like a specific thing and have it evoke wonder 
while at the same time applying boundaries to it that sort of curtail the amount of plausibility damage your world like endures from its presence right um so I think that's a really good place to kind of to kind of wind us down here, and I, I think it's yeah. it's a solid key takeaway. Uh, is there anything else you want to add? No, I think we've covered it. Yeah, it's uh, rarity, proximity, barriers to entry is how I would classify it, and just examining these different elements to help hopefully help you make sense of how these things fit together. But yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a great stopping point. That's perfect. So essentially, there's a million and one things you could throw in your world. Once you've figured out what you're going to prioritize and throw in there, being able to slow down and identify the elements that are going to cause some trouble, your krakens, your magic systems, all this kind of stuff. And then applying those three constraints on it, the proximity, rarity, and barriers to entry, allows you to make great stories out of that content while also managing the plausibility of the world that you're creating and ensuring that the items that you're kind of throwing in there can operate while the car is running, so to speak, while the body is still functioning and reacting. So that's really solid stuff, Andrew. Like, um, so where Thank can you. we where can we find your stuff? Where can we find your stuff? And where can we uh, where can we buy your book? So, in times of war, a tale of our Dalincor, which mm -hmm. is the first book in the Dalincor series, is available on Amazon. I'm actively working on writing book two. Oh. Uh, social, yeah. Social media. Uh, sorry, so what were you going to say? I'm sorry. I was just making excited noises. Uh, yeah. What, what, sorry. What, what, <laughs> do you have a Do you have scope on when that comes out? Your 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 next book. T TBD. TBD. I'm trying right. to Sounds I'm good. trying to progress things, but also I want it to marinate appropriately. So it's a it's a bit of a balance. Of <laughs> Appropriate marination is critical. Yes. So uh, I don't want to commit to a timeline, but uh, actively actively working on it perfect, for sure. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, Social media wise, most active on Instagram yeah. at our Dalincor. I also have a sub stack called Fantasy World Building. The, uh, the address to that is Andrew Zimba, my name, uh, andrewzimba.substack.com. Uh, as of the time that this uh, episode comes out, there's at least 20 articles that are up. And uh, I publish new ones twice a month on various aspects of world building, but usually on the how, like yeah. we've talked about here. Pick the things you want to pick. And for your, for the, the elements for your world, and then how do they come together? So that's that's more of the focus of each of those. Some are world building prompts. Uh, some take a deep dive on some particular aspects. But uh, that's been a lot of fun as well to share the knowledge that that I've acquired through working on my own story, building my own immersive world. So happy to share that with others as well. Perfect. All right. Well, dude, thanks so much for coming on with us. It was a joy to have you. Yeah, it's been fun. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, and thank you as well, dear viewers, for joining us for another episode of the Worldcraft Club podcast. Um, feel free to jump on our Discord. We actually had a member of our Discord on here, like Kraken Wise, once in a while in the in the chat. Thank you very much, Obsidian Cross, on the server, and we'll put a link to the server on there if you ever want to join in and listen in on episodes of the podcast or during our weekly discussions where we break down world building topics or just play world building games like Deck of Worlds back there behind me. So. Thanks so much for joining us. Don't forget to like and subscribe. This has been another episode of the Worldcraft Club podcast. See you next time.